in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with the true hearts and confess our sins unto God our Father, seeking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Today is the first chapter of the second book of Moses, which begins like this. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Ruby, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls. For Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. <clears throat> Today's text introduces us to the second book of the Bible, the book called Exodus. The first chapter gives us the background to the great deliverance of God, a redemption so unspeakably divine that it becomes a byword throughout the rest of the scripture, a picture of the people of God of every age who are spared by the blood of the Lamb, Christ Jesus. The text itself opens upon a grand stage, the ancient empire of Egypt. The first verse takes us back in time some 15 centuries before the beginning of the New Testament. And the name and the fame of the land of the Pharaoh is remembered today wherever school children still study history. There are two phenomena that mark this land in the northeast corner of Africa, Egypt. One of them is the Nile River, which is literally the lifeline in that country that, where there is no rainfall. That river overflows its banks once a year and turns Egypt's desert into a fertile farmland. The other phenomena is the monument the pyramids in particular, those ancient wonders of the world, marvelous pieces of engineering that are recognized by the world to this day. 
But the text does not pay any attention to that. The main point of the scripture is to tell you the story of Jesus Christ. The unfolding of God's plan of salvation. It began already on the first page of the Bible. Where we hear that God created man in his own image to be his friend, to be the special object of his love. We know how it worked out. How our first parents in self-will disobedience spoiled the picture. But God still wanted man to be his friend and live with him forever. So right there where you least expected in the Garden of Eden that they had wrecked, God first promised a deliverer, the seed of the woman who would come, who would bruise the head of the destroyer that destroys us with sin and death. Later on, the thread of that Savior promise may be traced throughout the whole Old Testament. Later on, of the three sons of Noah, one of them is chosen to be the bearer of that promise. And of the Shemite nations, one man is singled out to be the bearer of that Savior promise. The man by the name of Abraham, about whom there are 22 chapters in the scripture. A man whom we call the father of believers, and it's no wonder. For to Abraham, whom God simply chose out of the world's millions, God gave some remarkable promises. I will make of thee a great nation. In thee and thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Unto thee and thy seed will I give this land as far as you can see in every direction. And know of a surety that thy people will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they shall be afflicted four hundred years. But the people among whom they sojourn I will judge, and will bring out thy people with great wealth. And Abraham simply believed that promise. Here he was, an aged old man who had not a single child. But Abraham believed the Lord, that he would make of him a great nation, that one of his descendants in the distant future would be that one in whom all nations of the earth are blessed, if they're ever going to be blessed at all. Then God would give that land to his descendants, though so Abram himself owned not a single square foot of it. And that his people, suffering affliction, 400 years would be brought out with great wealth. Abram believed the Lord. And so it happened that in his old age he had a son. And he passed the promise down to Isaac. In length of time, Isaac had two sons, and Jacob was chosen to be the bearer of that precious promise. Jacob had 12 sons, and of that number, Judah was singled out, from whose line the promised Savior one day would come. You see, that's why the text coolly bypasses the impressive pyramid. And that tantalizing subject about mummifying the dead, which the Egyptians did so well. Our text coolly ignores the vast network of irrigation canals in Egypt. And the unparalleled magnitude of the priestly temple at On. Instead, our text points us to the land of Goshen in Egypt points us to a despised band of people who dwell there and have for nearly three and a half centuries. And tells us that among those people, bound up in that wretched bundle, is the story of your salvation and mine. No, God did not choose the children of Israel because of their brilliance or intelligence because of their physical strength or political standing, and certainly not because of their religious piety or inherent goodness. 
Quite the contrary, the prophets like to remind them, there has never been a nation ever on the face of the earth so unthankful and unbelieving, bullheaded and stubborn as you. The fact that God chose you, the children of Israel at all, is a sermon all by itself on God's unmerited mercy, God's limitless grace. The Holy Spirit wants you to notice the people dwelling in the land of Goshen for your salvation and mine is bound up in the safekeeping of the children of Israel. How they got to Egypt is quite a story. If you ever heard it, you never forgot it. How Father Jacob favored one of his twelve sons, Joseph. There were some good reasons for that. There were some reasons that weren't very good either. Remember how his brothers hated him. The favorite of the father. The little prince promenading about in his multicolored coat. On a day far from home, they wanted to kill their brother Joseph. And the only reason they didn't do it was because they sold him to a slaver's caravan traveling south. Out of their sight forever! Or so they thought. And the multicolored coat they stained with blood and dirt and carried back to their father to show him, who also thought he would never more on earth see his son Joseph. Years passed. Twenty of them, till a famine so severe in Palestine that the brothers and the sons of Jacob had to go to Egypt to buy bread or starve to death. Never once did it enter their mind to question the identity of the great Egyptian, Vathnes Paeonia, prime minister of Egypt's mighty empire sitting on a throne high and lifted up, at whose feet they now humbly bowed, begging for bread, like a flash of lightning on a clear day. They heard the great Egyptians say in their own Hebrew tongue, I am Joseph, your brother. And he also said to their terror-stricken conscience, But fear not, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. As it has come to pass this day to save much people alive. And truly God had turned their evil into good to save much people alive. Joseph procedures before the famine saved Egypt, saved Egypt politically, economically, and nationally. But more than that, he now invited his father and his entire household to come down to the land of Egypt to live. He saved their lives also. They gave them the district of Goshen to live in, the river basin of the Nile. The Egyptians didn't want it anyway, and besides, every herdsman was an abomination to the Egyptians who were farmers. And there in Goshen, Father Jacob died. And there in Goshen, his sons died. Joseph also died. And then silence. Three and a half centuries of silence. How they fared in the land of Goshen, in Egypt, but not really of Egypt. And undoubtedly, they had social and economic contacts with the Egyptians. They must have learned a thing or two about Egyptian art and agriculture and industry. For the most part, the children of Israel in Goshen were still strangers in a strange land. And all the while, without any noise whatsoever, quietly one of God's promises is passing into fulfillment. 
Though when he first uttered that promise, it seemed incredible that it could ever come to pass. There's a little verse in the chapter that reminds us of it. In fact, it heaps it up, piles it together, states it and restates it five times in one verse so that you don't miss it. The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. So, because God promised, because God never breaks his word, because God had assured believing Abraham that he would make of him a great nation who had no children, now over the centuries that promise comes to pass. Down there in Goshen is growing a mighty, numerous nation. Do they think of that? God's promise always coming through. That would be an incomparable comfort to them in the days that lie ahead. When the going gets rough, to remember that God keeps every promise. They can see he kept that one, but that he would keep the other one also and bring them safely out after 400 years of affliction. There arose a new king, the text tells us, a new dynasty now in Egypt, which did not know Joseph. Man's memory is off the shore. His gratitude is probably even shorter. Came to the throne of Egypt, now a king who no more remembered that Joseph the Hebrew was a great national hero, that he had saved the Egyptian empire and her people, that he had made their country exceedingly wealthy. This king sees the people in the land of Goshen as a menace a subversive element to the national security. Or at least, that's what he says in his political speeches. Behold, the children of Israel are mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. Lest they multiply and it come to pass when there be war, they join with their enemies and get them up out of the land. You catch that? Get up out of the land. If the Pharaoh really believed they were a subversive menace to the national security, then he would have wanted them out of the land, far from his border. But he wants the chief labor. So he gives a speech about the national security when it's really the national economy that he's talking about. And a person can only wonder how many times that weary trick has been played and worked. Three measures Pharaoh Institute. And the first is to make taskmasters to appoint the men of Israel to hard bondage, to labor bitterly with brick and mortar. And they have to build the treasure cities of Python and Ramsey. And they do. And it works just the way you would think if you thought about it for a moment. Contrary to what the king expected, the harder they work, the more muscles they got, the stronger their sinew, the more strength they had as a nation. Why is it that we do not think of that when we complain of our work and our hours, our toil and our labor, that it's good for us? If you and I make ourselves too comfortable here in this earth, how shall we ever yearn for our eternal rest? Really, now, if we fall in love with our air-conditioned and our finely furnished home, 
How shall we ever long for those heavenly mansions? If we take it easy, make things secure and safe for ourselves, run no risk. How can God ever do a great thing for us, lifting us up? Well, that measure didn't work. Neither does the second one, but it's crueler. He summons two women who are head of the Guild of Midwives, Shifra and Pua, and he orders them they should pass the word along. Whenever a male child is born, they should put it to death. Most cases, the parents wouldn't even know. And yes, yes, you will be well reimbursed and taken care of for this with the sly wink. But the Pharaoh didn't count on the fear of the women. Oh, not the fear of him. The fear of God. Those women had a holy reverence for the living God and were not afraid of the might what men might do to them. Whether they never passed the word on, or whether they simply hauled off and disobeyed it, one thing is sure, when they are called to give an account, they say, well, sir, the Israelite gals are not a bunch of pampered sissies the way the Egyptian women are. And when we get the call, and arrive on the scene, the Egyptian woman has already gone into labor, delivered, long gone. They laid their lives on the line. And the Holy Spirit has seen fit to commemorate the two names of those courageous women till the end of time, Shifra and Pua. And God, because they built the house of his people, God gave them a family and a husband and a house of their own. And now in an insane rage, the king throws all restraints to the wind. He orders all of his people everywhere, saying, every son that is born he shall cast into the river and every daughter ye shall save alive. How many little ones suffered that day? How many homes were broken? How many fathers lost their lives trying to protect their wives and their wives' sons? Remember this when the hour of judgment comes in a couple of chapters and the bleeding heart start whimpering about the cruelty of God to the poor old Egyptian. And remember this, that in your own country last year, nearly a million American unborn defenseless infants were put to death or used for experimentation purposes in abortion mills from La Crosse to our four borders. And remember that when the hour of judgment comes, that there be no bleeding heart whimpering for the unjust judgment of God that is sure to come. Well, now they had nothing to fall back on, no heart but God to cast themselves upon. They had no human defense against this measure. And did they think of it? of the promises of God that are never broken. The Lord is going to deliver them now, but in a way that men most likely not to expect it. For the very decree of the king meant to destroy them as the cross was raised to destroy Christ will become the very means of a very great salvation. But that, in the next chapter, which we commend to your private study, our sermon topic for next week, God willing. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
Amen.